My name is Mara and welcome to Books Like Whoa. Okay, Project Poirot. Chugging along here. Um, yeah. Ooh, guys, it's getting, it is getting really hard to continue in this project, I've got to tell you, because the books are just not that good. Um, you got, if you are a longtime reader of Agatha Christie, you probably know this, um, that we are well into the 60s, about to be into the 70s, and like, shit is just not as good at this point. Oh, I should mention that the book we're talking about this week is Halloween Party by Agatha Christie, and it, it's, I think, like the 35th-ish book that we've read for this somewhere in there and yeah we'll get into it but before we do let me just give you my little warning that I always do at the beginning of Project Poirot videos and that is I am reading all of the Poirot books by Agatha Christie uh, in the order roughly of publication slash roughly chronological it gets a little weird sometimes with the short story collections but generally order of publication um, and I do video I do these like discussion videos slash review and I don't get into spoilers so I'm not gonna tell you who did it and I'm not gonna tell you how anything like that I will get into some character details which in retrospect sometimes might be considered spoilery but I kind of approach this with the mindset that if you have never read the book before I don't think anything I'm going to talk about will be like ruining it for you so proceed with caution but that is that is my warning um so yeah without further ado let's get into Halloween party okay so uh this book is set in probably like 1968 ish it was written I think in 1969 so it's at the end of the 60s and we have as we have had for the last several books and we'll continue to have um Mrs. Ariadne Oliver as a central character in this book with Paro and she has made friends with a woman named Judith Butler which when I hear that all I can think about is gender trouble but anyway um this is pre-gender trouble I'm sure uh, and Judith Butler is in a little uh, town out uh, I think like 30 or 40 miles outside of London and uh, Mrs. Oliver is visiting her um, Judith has a daughter named Mir uh, named Miranda and anyway they are helping uh, set up a local party like Halloween party for the kids of this little village which is called Woodley Common and it's a weird party because it's for 10 to 17 year olds like what a like that just feels like a very bizarre age range but anyway um it's being hosted at a place called i think apple trees which is like a, a an estate a home like it is a home that has a name so there you go um of a widow named mrs drake and they are setting up this halloween party for the local kids and uh there's a lot of people there who are helping some of them being uh the kids who are going to be attending themselves as well as a bunch of different adults um and in the midst of this one of the girls uh who is miranda judith butler's daughters best friend Joyce Reynolds so Joyce is like kind of a brat like no one really likes Joyce she's sort of the worst and she's very she's known for being very like um boastful or like kind of bragging to get attention and I forget exactly how this comes up but basically she ends up bragging that one time she saw a murder and she she saw somebody commit a murder once and everyone's just sort of like brushes her off or whatever and says like whatever you're just lying again <laughs> as is your want um and they're like why didn't you go to the police and she's like oh i wasn't sure what i saw at the time whatever no one really pays that much attention um until the next day at the party which you know kind of goes off without a hitch you know they're kind of going through the party which is like there's a lot of different kind of activities there's like this thing where you can see your future husband um apple bobbing a couple of other things and at the end of the party nobody can figure out where joyce is and eventually she is found having been drowned in the tub that was used for apple bobbing. So it's the death of like, I think she's 13, 12 or 13. So kind of like pretty dark, the death of a child, much like in Dead Man's Folly. Um, and actually very similar characters in terms of the, the victim. But anyway, um, so she is killed. And kind of the official explanation is that it is like just a stranger, like a random stranger who, like there's a lot of talk about like sex murderers. Um, we'll get into that but the kind of official explanation at first is just that it was like a random stranger with no motive that just sort of it was sort of a crime of opportunity however uh mrs oliver doesn't really think that this is the case and she thinks that joyce was killed because of the statement she'd made the previous day saying that she that she had witnessed a murder so uh mrs oliver asks Hercule Poirot to come investigate he does there's more you know mayhem and murder and whatnot um and eventually of course he 
figures out who done it. So I'm trying to think if you really need to know much about the characters in this book or if I can just get into some analysis. I mean, I told you about Judith and Miranda. Those are the, the butlers. They're important. Um, they're, you know, they're who Mrs. Oliver's staying with. The, Joyce has uh, two siblings. I believe they're Anne and Leopold. They become important. Um, her parents, the Mr. and Mrs. Reynolds are around. Uh, that party takes place at Mrs. Drake's house. There are some other children uh, at the party who are characterized. I think there's Nicholas and Desmond they come up and I'll kind of um, mention something specific from them later. Uh, there is a gardener who uh, did this famous local garden in the in a abandoned quarry and I think his name is Garfield. Yeah, 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 yeah. Garfield. Michael Garfield. So he's a famous like landscape architect who's around. Um, we have some other recurring characters because Superintendent Spence has retired to Woodley Common of all of the places. Um, and I think we last saw him in Mrs. McGinney's Dead, so he's back. And then Mr. Gobi, who is uh, Poirot's Poirot, he's a, pr a private detective that Poirot uses from time to time, uh, he also provides some information. So I think that's most of the main characters you need to know about. There's like, there's a, l there's a lot of people in this and we will get to that. But anyway, I think that's enough for us to dive into a analysis slash my thoughts. Yeah, so I um, I don't know if I mentioned this when I did the Hollow review, but the first two books that I ever read from Agatha Christie were The Hollow and this one, Halloween Party. Um, I picked them up uh, in Heathrow on my way back from studying abroad in Cambridge and I was like feeling very like, no, I don't wanna leave. And so I was like, I'm gonna pick up something like quintessentially British and like enjoy this on the flight. And who knew it was gonna be the launch of a love affair. But anyway, um, so the, this was one of the first, it was either the first or the second book that I read from Agatha Christie. I can't remember what, which order I read them on that flight. But um, I have some affection for this book just because it like launched me into Christie. And I should preface everything I'm going to say with, this was one of the first books I read from her, if not the first, and you see where I got to with Agatha Christie. So like, it's not that in the scheme of things, this is terrible. And I think if you've never read a lot of Agatha Christie, then like you, this would probably still be pretty charming because there are some good parts of it. The thing is, it's just bad. Like for for an Agatha Christie book, this is not good. Um, I, I don't know if it's quite at the bottom, but like it's, it's pretty close to the bottom of the ones that I've read just because I think that there's some fundamental issues with the story. And this is this, the same critique that I've had for the last, for several of the last few ones, which is that I, there's too much chance to this whole thing. There's a lot of coincidence you kind of have to swallow to go with this book. And um, Poirot is not making as many like brilliant deductions as he is being lucky in some of his guesses often, I think. And I find the conclusion of this book to be like melodramatic and absurd. Like this book is just like kind of nonsense <laughs> in terms of how it wraps up in my opinion. The thing is that there's a lot of like pieces to this that could be really good and that's probably why I enjoyed it at the time because I think that there's a lot of promise here and like again something I've been saying for the last few I think she sets up a really interesting idea here which is this idea of like why was this bratty little girl like viciously murdered. I mean, like drowning a 13 year old in an apple bobbing bucket. Like that's, that's like a thing, right? Like that's a pretty, a dramatic premise to a mystery. So there's a lot of promise here. I just don't think she know she's just not delivering on it. And that, and that's a consistent critique at this point in her career for me. Um, pretty much starting, I'm gonna say definitely by Cat Among the Pigeons onwards. There's a lot of good ideas and not a lot of good execution. And I definitely think that's the case for this one. And I think this is one of the worst executed ones that I've read from her. So it's gonna be pretty close to the bottom for me, but there are some interesting things happening. So let's get into that. And by the way, guys, I'm sorry, like a gigantic thunderstorm just rolled in. So if you hear anything, I'm sorry. And also the lighting got really not great. So I apologize for that as well. But um, hopefully, I mean, it's booktube. We're all pretty forgiving of the technical aspects of YouTube here on booktube. So I'm sure you'll be fine. But anyway, let's get into analysis. So by far and away, the thing that is most interesting to me in this book is the kind of general understanding of the idea of like a sex murderer and the idea of random acts of violence as being just a commonly accepted potential 
um, kind of answer to a crime. And we've seen we've seen this a couple of times uh, previous to this one um, coming up as the idea of like just like random murder. I mean, the ABC murders being a notable example of, you know, as early as I think that book was in the 30s, it not being completely out of the social imaginary that somebody, a random stranger might come and kill you. But I think it's a, just such a theme in this one driving home. And I think it's some social commentary because at the time there was a lot of discussion uh, I mean, there there had been some of these types of murders in the UK um, that had gotten a lot of no notoriety from what I can tell, as well as there was a lot of discussion of the mental health facilities um, uh, available uh, being over full and therefore people who were not mentally stable being released. Um, if you live in the US, you definitely are familiar with that discussion when it comes to all of our mass shootings love how the only time anybody cares about mental health is when uh, we have, you know, people with mental uh, illnesses to blame for our horrifying cultural phenomenon that is mass shootings. But anyway, that's a side note. Um, but this is clearly some social commentary because this is apparently something that was very like present in people's minds at the time. And um, yeah, I think that that to me is the most interesting part of this book. Um, Poirot encounters a couple of uh, young guys who were at the party who really want to help him. And I just wanted to read you uh, a quote from them kind of their, which I think is just interesting because it's sort of like, this is their explanation for what must have happened. This is this is just an interesting um, to see how she is portraying the minds of like 15, 16 year old um, young men and sort of what they at this point in history think is a natural explanation for what happened. And so they say, what about the curate, said Desmond hopefully. He might be a bit off his nut. You know, original sin perhaps, and all that, and the water, and the apples, and the things, and then, look here, I've got a good idea now. Suppose he is a bit barmy. Not been here very long. Nobody knows much about him. Supposing it's the snapdragon put it into his head. Hellfire, all those flames going up. Then you see, he took hold of Joyce and said, come along with me and I'll show you something. And he took her to the apple room and he said, kneel down. And he said, this is a baptism and pushed her head in. See, it would all fit. Adam and Eve and the apple and hellfire and the snapdragon and being baptized again to cure you of sin. Perhaps he exposed himself to her first, said Nicholas, hopefully. I mean, there's always got to be a sex background to all these things. They both looked with satisfied faces to Poirot. Well, said Poirot, you've certainly given me something to think about. <laughs> I just think that that type of uh, detailed explanation and detailed sort of like symbolic analysis of why this curate might be a sex murderer um, is something that I don't know that we would have seen a lot of in previous decades in, in Agatha Christie. So I just think it's very telling of the times in terms of how people are thinking about the psychology of murder. Nowadays, we're very used to getting these kinds of explanations from things like uh, Criminal Minds or like, you know, a, a lot of like um, Law and Order SVU or like anything that's talking about um, kind of random sexual crime, um, this kind of like symbolic idea about how uh, murderers think um, is pretty pretty par for the course. But at the time, um, I think this is something that's an emerging understanding of how the kind of psychopathy of um, random strangers killing each other might work. We also have, and I mentioned this as like sort of a, um, a in passing in the last one, but again, we really see Agatha Christie being very critical of um, mothers and how mothering now works and the amount of permissiveness that young people are allowed to have. It's the late 60s by this point, the sexual revolution is like, it has revolted and Agatha is not here for it. That's just sort of the bottom line. So um, I think that's that's interesting to think about as well. And we see this kind of at a multi-generational level, I'll say, um, how mothers over time may have uh, responded to sexual promiscuity in their, in their girls. I think Agatha Christie basically has a sense that it's part of a mother's duty to kind of protect her daughter and she's very critical of, of women who she feels like have not done that. So, and it's interesting when you think uh, from the autobiographical aspect because her mother definitely was pretty involved in her upbringing, but um, Agatha Christie was pretty absentee as a mother uh, and yeah, so it, it's interesting to kind of think about why she 
has this particular feeling about mothers. And then I just think in general it's interesting to the the amount of violence against children in this book is pretty jarring. Um, and I think just generally the portrayal of young people. Um, I mentioned in my check-in video how she seems to be pretty um, open-minded to kids these days. That is up through I would say roughly the 50s. By the 60s, and Dane Reed's pointed this out to me because he's recently read a Marple from this period at, um, at Bertram's hotel. By the 60s, she like cannot deal with the hippies. That's what I've realized. Like she could go along with the 50s and like, you know, the bebopping, you know, sock cops, whatever. Like once we get to the 60s and their long hair and their like free love, she cannot do that. So like she is no longer down with the kids these days. And that is really evident in this particular book. So just side note on that. But yeah, I'm gonna wrap this up because like, I, I don't know if I look as dark to you as I do to me in my little window. Um, but this thunderstorm is getting real and I kind of want to go find my flashlight. So um, I'll just wrap this up by saying that uh, I did not like this book. I clearly enjoyed it the first time enough to send me on my Agatha Christie journey. So again, all of these rankings are relative because like it's Agatha Christie and even a bad Agatha Christie is very enjoyable. There's a lot of pieces of this book that were enjoyable as well, but I think when I was kind of thinking about ranking, I was like, I can't say that this is a better book than Taken at the Flood, so I gotta put it under that. I did enjoy it more than The Clocks, I will say. Um, I think that there's more Poirot in it. There's Ariadne Oliver, who's a goddamn delight, and she makes all of these later books better, I feel like, um, because Agatha Christie just clearly has more energy to write her, um, so it makes it more fun to read. But anyway, I would put this under Taken of the Flood, but above the clock, so like damn near the bottom of the list. Um, yeah, and next week is Elephants Can Remember, and it's not gonna be that great either, so <laughs> spoilers, but you will have to tune in next week to get my full thoughts on that. So anyway, I'm gonna go before I lose power and I'm completely submerged into darkness. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please like, subscribe, follow me on the social meds if you are so inclined. I have all that information listed in the description box below, and I think that will do it. I hope you're having a really great day, and I will talk to you soon. Bye!